Good morning. I'm a chemist. Now, when I tell people that, they usually sort of roll their eyes. They say, oh, I hated chemistry in school already, and that's the end of a conversation. <laughs> or they go on and then they say, oh, yeah, we know your type. You pollute our rivers and kill our forests. <laughs> and yeah, that's what we do. I'm evil too. Because I want to kill these cute looking guys. Um, terrible, right? Turns out these guys themselves are killers. This is the causative agent of malaria, Plasmodium falciparum. Two to two and a half million children die every year from it. If you go to a hospital, even in Germany, and you contract this guy here, Staphylococcus aureus, that's a hospital acquired bacterial infection, then you have a major, major problem. And I don't want to kill them myself, but I would like to teach your bodies to recognize them and destroy them. Of course, you all know that we have vaccines against a number of diseases. We can have smallpox, polio, diphtheria, tetanus. All these can be prevented, and hopefully you had your children vaccinated. I will show you today that we can create vaccines based on carbohydrates to recognize these pathogens and protect people from dying from those preventable diseases. But before I go there, I would like to briefly just take you through a process of developing such a vaccine from both a time and a cost standpoint. It all starts with research. We start to look for certain molecules that may be a basis for such a vaccine. And that takes somewhere between four or sometimes more years and costs anywhere to about $10 million. Then, once a molecule has been identified, there's going to be what's called a preclinical development. At that stage, we're going to test things in animals, and we're going to do a scale-up to make more material in hopes to actually create enough of this um, vaccine to then use it in trials in humans. And once you go to humans, that gets more expensive, and it's so-called first clinical phase. All you do is you're going to only look for safety. If I take a material and I introduce it in a human, does the person get any sort of ill health effects? If that's not the case, then we can go to the next phase in which we actually look now in a pivotal trial. Is the molecule we have here, or vaccine, actually efficacious? Does it actually protect the person from the disease we like to protect from? And that can be very, very lengthy, and it can be very, very expensive. $200 million is not out of the question in most cases. Once that works, you go to a broader trial, which is called a phase three trial, many, many clinical centers, and even more dollars spent. So the overall process takes anywhere from 10 to 15 years, and sometimes longer, and somewhere in a range between 300 and 500 million US dollars for just one vaccine. <laughs> 300 million dollars, a lot of money, at least for me. Um, but it's all relative. It's all relative if you think about that the German government, for example, decided to spend 130 billion US dollars to save the Hypo Real Estate Bank just one bank. For that money, we could have developed all the vaccines we can think of. Now, how much money do we really need? So let's just focus on one disease. Let's focus on malaria, just for sake of argument here. WHO, World Health Organization, tells us we have to come with a vaccine under five US dollars per child. We have 65 million children living in endemic areas in Africa and Asia that are at risk of contracting malaria. $5 per child, 65 million children, $325 million cost per year. 1 to 2.5 million children die per year from malaria, depending on which estimates you believe. So if we divide the first number by the second number, we get a cost per life somewhere in the range of 150 to 300 US dollars. Now, maybe I'm off by a factor of 10, but even then, it's still not that much money. So we really should be thinking about developing vaccines. And I'm not just talking about malaria. I'm also talking about things, as I showed you, um, Staphylococcus aureus or this guy here, Streptococcus pneumoniae. This should be a concern to all of you because people in Europe do get this. And the question is, how are we going to educate our immune system to recognize them, because they don't look like this usually, right? I mean, that's a microscopic image that's blown up. So we have to somehow teach the immune system that there must be some sort of molecule on the surface that allows it to recognize this. And there are proteins on top of these um, cells, 
but there are also sugars on top of all cells. Now you're going to say the guy is completely insane. Sugar is the stuff I put in my coffee this morning, and that looks like this, and not anything like that. The sugars I'm talking about are not the sugars you put in your coffee. That consists of two building blocks. Sugars I talk about, they surround the outside of both human cells as well as cells of bacteria and parasites. And those sugars are very, very long chains. And, well, they look a little bit like the surface um, of a cell which we sort of try to recreate. I'm sorry, I just sort of um, pull this out here. We try to recreate uh, from Lego, right? It's rebuilding reality today. Um, so that's what it looks like. There are long, there are long um, chains coming out, and they are branched, and they are complex. And if you ever had the pleasure of going to a hospital, you probably got a shot in your stomach every day to make your blood not coagulate. It's an anticoagulant. It's called heparin, and it's a huge drug which is extracted from um, pig's guts. That's a carbohydrate. Also, there are therapeutic proteins, these long things out here. These therapeutic proteins are hormones such as, for example, erythropoietin. It's a red blood cell stimulant that's made for cancer patients that suffer from anemia. Now, it turns out these are not the only people who take this. You may have never heard of this, but you probably realize that, I, I just make this up. These guys supposedly also take EPO, and that's a glycoprotein. That means it's a protein with a carbohydrate on top. So carbohydrates are very complex. They're all around our cells. And what we want to teach the immune system is to recognize these carbohydrates and then mount an immune response and attack those cells with these carbohydrates on their surface. So that's a picture of um, Staphylococcus aureus. And this is also yellow here, this flower. And what you can have on the outside are these um, carbohydrates. Actually, plants also consist mainly of carbohydrates. And what we need to get is we need to get access to these carbohydrates out here. Now, the reason we have to get access is very simple. There is the creation of a vaccine that involves the carbohydrate that we need to make an immune response against. But the key problem is that our immune system does not recognize carbohydrates as foreign. Just can't do that. What our immune system can do very well, it can recognize proteins as foreign. And so what we do is we take things like diphtheria toxoid or tetanus toxoid that all of us have been vaccinated against, so enemy number one, and we combine that chemically through linking it to the carbohydrate. So our immune system gets now what's called a conjugate. It says, ah, enemy number one, the protein I know, I make an immune response against it, and while I'm in the process of doing that, I also start recognizing the second carbohydrate. So what we really need to do is we need to get access to these carbohydrates. So now comes the experimental part of a lecture. Um, we need to get access here, right? So vegetarians amongst you might want to phase away. Um, basically, we are trying to um, get access to these guys, and we're going to isolate these things, right? So we're going to put them in here. We're going to do the isolation. And good. All right. So. What we're going to get is basically a mess. <laughs> but this is how carbohydrate-based vaccines are made today. People grow bacteria. I just used a plan to show you this. They, they grow bacteria, and then they harvest the carbohydrates, and they um, then conjugate them. Now there's a great idea. It's already working. There are three vaccines on the market based on this technology. But the problem is that not all pathogens can be cultured. Plasmodium, for example, won't do it. Many others don't do it. And the second problem is that even if you can culture the organism, you may not be able to pull out the carbohydrate. The purification is very, very difficult. And that's where I come in. Chemists have spent a long time trying to rebuild biomolecules. My PhD advisor, for example, in 1980, developed the chemistry that eventually led to a machine that allows you to, by chemical synthesis, create genetic material, DNA. In that year, he started a biotech company. Some of you may have heard about it. It's called Amgen, the largest biotech company, which was based on this technology. Being able to make the molecules was the first step to create um, afterwards drugs. The same holds true in the case of proteins. Chemists have figured out ways to make proteins by chemical means. And I did my PhD in both of those areas. And mid-90s, 
we start looking at that third class of biopolymers, namely carbohydrates, and those are very, very complicated. They're not just simple linear chains. They are branched, and then there's also differences in how they are sterically connected to each other. So people said, the only way we get to carbohydrates is by brute force purification. And we said, no, there must be ways to recreate carbohydrates just like these other two classes of molecules. And yes, it was true, people can and could make actually carbohydrates. For example, one you see in the upper left side here was made as a potential cancer vaccine in the mid-90s. It took people between a year and a year and a half to make this material. Of course, you have to go through iterative processes and then your timelines become so long and so expensive that this is not tenable. So when we started to think about the ways, how can we build up these complex carbohydrates from simpler means? And what we came up with was a method in which you would take simple pre-manufactured building blocks, which would be modular, and then come up with a simple chemical process that allows us to bring them together and thereby recreate the flower I destroyed previously. <laughs> um, so this was a key innovation in chemistry because it allowed us to very, very simply then get access to these kinds of molecules and it was so simple that a machine could actually carry this out, this process. And that machine allowed us then to make the same sort of molecule, not in a year, but allowed us to make the same thing in hours or maybe a day. So a huge step forward in that regard. And that then laid the foundation about 10 years ago to look at the vaccine discovery process in a totally new way. Because now we have basically a cookie cutter type approach in which we can say, okay, for many pathogens, we know what's outside of their cells. We know the carbohydrates, so we have a target. So we can take our synthesizer and we can put what we call the antigen, so the, the identifying carbohydrate, we can put this together by chemical means. We then bring it together with this carrier protein to make this conjugate, which is being then used to be introduced first into experimental animals, mice or rats. Then comes a brutal step, you actually have to get these animals infected with a disease and you see, are they protected? In the case of malaria, we can now protect 100% of animals in the challenge experiments. Now, obviously, I don't want to create a vaccine for mice or rats. I want to create a vaccine for humans. And to do that, we have to then go and do a preclinical development, which also means we have to create enough material. This here is five kilos sugar. Five kilos of sugar is enough to vaccinate 65 million children born in endemic areas against malaria. That's microgram quantities per child and the cost for just materials less than one dollar. So our technology allowed not just to make a material fast, but also now to make large enough quantities. This cannot be done anymore within an academic research institution and that's why my first PhD student started this company Ancora um, in the United States while I was still a professor at MIT. This material is now just before clinical development. But we should not just say, well, okay, Seaburger is working on some malarial vaccines. It doesn't have any relevance to us. It does have relevance to us. Because malaria is very far advanced. But at this moment, we are working on 20 different vaccine candidates that are of high relevance to you. Because we are working on things like group A streptococcus and staphylococcus aureus. These are hospital-acquired infections. And this little guy here with his little K back here, this is a superbug. You've probably heard of superbugs just this morning in the German news. They talked about it. There are no antibiotics against it. So we are trying to create the most cost-efficient means to protect ourselves and our society from these guys by creating vaccines against them. We work on bacteria that affect your children, such as Moraxella cataris or meningitis B. We also work on um, Things, I think this has shifted a little bit, there's some more, which you don't see down here, such as sexually transmitted diseases, including um, chlamydia and others. So this is all going on right now. So the clear message I can send to you this morning is, we have the technology to rebuild these vaccines and to develop them. But in order to develop them, we have to think about together, how can we change the system? Because today, vaccines are made by pharmaceutical companies. This was the only people who can do that. And pharmaceutical companies 
are traded on a stock exchange. All of us are investors in those companies, in our retirement funds and otherwise. And we expect those companies to make money. Because we have our money, we're supposed to make more of it. And if we don't make enough of it, our money goes to car companies or somebody else, and that's perfectly fair. But we expect them to do things that cannot return any money because there's no money to be made. At the same time, for our society, we would like to have the benefits of cheap means to protect us and people in endemic areas from these terrible diseases. And we all usually agree on that part. But somebody's going to pay for it. Now the question is, how are we going to do that? So pharmaceutical industry, it's difficult because of the profit they have to make. For academia, it's basically impossible because the process I showed you is so expensive and so lengthy and takes so much expertise. This expertise is not there. So right now in Berlin, we are thinking about creating possibly a new institution, but somewhere in between that, an institution that doesn't have to make profit and that's funded in new ways. And that's what we get back to now because we have to start to think about how do we fund such an effort? One way you can think about would be crowdfunding, everybody putting money in, government of course can put money in. There are different ways and maybe together we can think about this. Thank you very much.